Good morning, students. Welcome back to Online Sunday School. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, by now, I think everybody's back at school. If I'm thinking right, it's kind of confusing because every school district seems to be doing something different. But hope school's going well for you. The year started out fine. I know some of you are probably bummed to be back at school, but it's good for you. I think it's a good thing for you to be back at school not at home all the time. Uh, we may have some students I don't know of that are doing virtual learning. I hope you stay on top of your studies, or staying disciplined, and I'm grateful. Uh, if you're joining me for online Sunday school, I suspicion that you are actually a student who is self-disciplined, that works hard, uh, because I know not your average student is viewing uh, the Sunday school lessons. I just want to commend you and encourage you uh, that well done. If you're watching this video and you've been tracking with our Sunday school lessons, I'm proud of you. I'm thankful for your heart to learn and learn the most important thing, which is God's Word. And that is what we seek to do here is teach God's Word and lift high the name of Jesus. If you've been tracking along with us, our series is, Why Do We Need the Church? We're answering this very important question by looking at the book of Ephesians. And we've seen several answers to that question, Why Do We Need the Church? Last week, we studied Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 32. And we saw that we need the church because we need the encouragement of the church. We desperately need the encouragement of of God's people, especially in the times that we live in. It's, it's really easy to get discouraged if we take our focus off of Christ. And one of the ways that we can keep our focus on Christ is the encouragement of God's people, uh, pointing us to Jesus and encouraging God's work in our lives. Well, today we are now moving to Ephesians chapter 5, and this is a lengthy passage today. It's an important passage uh, a lengthy passage, but the answer to the question today, why do we need the church? We need to be strengthened by the church. Now, I may not look like it now, but at one point in my life, I used to go to the gym and lift weights, in particular while I was in seminary. I had my roommate, Andrew, and one of our sweet mates, uh, Nate, who would go with us, and I would go into the weight room and see, in high school, I, I never played football. I, I didn't do weight training. I, I, I was and am a weakling, uh, even to this day. But I went to the weight room and started to embarrass myself, was horrific at the bench press, was horrific at every kind of exercise that you could think of. But I started going regularly, and an amazing thing happened to me. Uh, the, the flab that I've got now actually started to get firm. Uh, I was getting stronger. I was building muscle and was in the best shape of my life at that point. And now I'm, I'm not anymore. But it helped me to, to grow stronger, to have Andrew and Nate to hold me accountable and to go with me to the gym to help me out to be my spotter when I was bench pressing and have their encouragement. Because there were a lot of days I did not want to go back to the gym, especially earlier on when I was really sore. But the statement, no pain, no gain, is certainly true with weightlifting. Well, in the same way as you and I need to exercise in order to grow stronger physically, you and I need the church in order to grow stronger spiritually. One of God's ways of growing us spiritually is the church to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ around God's Word, singing about Him, teaching, uh, receiving teaching about Him, and receiving encouragement from God's Word. And the Lord uses that in mighty ways to strengthen us. And this is one of the reasons I think for many of us during the pandemic of COVID-19, many of us were not strengthened spiritually because we were missing that vital part of God's design in our lives, which is the church. And especially, I've noticed this in you students. Some of you are not where you were before the pandemic, pandemic struck. 
I think a vital part of your spiritual life has been missing, which is the church. And I'm grateful, by and large, we're able to meet in person together. We've been meeting on Wednesday nights uh, since June. I hope we'll be back in in-person Sunday school soon. Uh, as much as we can be in person together, I think it's best for you and for me. But we're going to see here, Paul's going to continue in his instruction from last week. If you remember, he, he told the Ephesian believers to put on Christ, to live out their new identity in Jesus Christ. And in reality, Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 21, is a continue of Paul's instruction. If you are truly in Christ, you're going to walk in certain ways. And when I say walk, the pattern and practice of your life is going to be consistent with the Scriptures, what the Scriptures command us to do. And we're, we're going to see here, Paul's going to command us to walk in three different ways. He's going to tell us to walk in love, to walk in light, and lastly, to walk in in wisdom. Now, I, my hope and prayer, and we're going to go to God in prayer here, is that he would help us to understand this lengthy passage. But I, I pray that you and I will be committed to walk in these ways. So let's ask for God's help today. Lord, we come to you right now, and we know apart from you, we can do nothing. We know that we can't rightly understand this passage we're about to study apart from the Holy Spirit opening the eyes of our hearts, helping us to understand the truth of your word, this is your inspired word. It's not our inspired word. And so because of that, because this is your supernaturally inspired word, we desperately ask you, God, please help us to see the truth in this passage and rightly apply it to our lives. God, we love you and we praise you. We ask all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So three ways we are to walk. And the first way is to walk in love. So if you have a Bible, open to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll begin in verses 1 and 2, as Paul commands us to walk in love. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So Paul begins with a clear imperative or command here in verse 1. He tells us to be imitators of God. We are to imitate our Heavenly Father, imitate His character. We know who God is. He is the Lord. He is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But He will by no means clear the guilty. Uh, this is Numbers 14, 18. This is the way God describes Himself in the Old Testament, it speaks of his patience, how he slowed anger, his, his grace and his mercy and his steadfast love. But it also speaks to his justice. He will by no means clear the guilty. And so as we study the Bible, you and I can learn of who God is by studying his attributes, his characteristics, if you will. Who is our God? And Paul tells us we are to study who God is and imitate him. All of us imitate someone. You probably look up to an athlete. Uh, you look up to a celebrity. Maybe there's someone in your life that you look up to. We're all imitating someone. The one who we should imitate most should be God. And why should we imitate him? Well, there at the end of verse 1. Because we are his beloved children. The greatest motivation to obey the scriptures is rightly understanding the way that God loves you. He doesn't just sort of love you. He dearly loves you. No one loves you more than our God. And that is our greatest motivation. As we look at the commands of Scripture, why obey Him? Just like, why obey your parents? Well, at the end of the day, the greatest motivation that you have to obey your parents is if they love you. And the greatest motivation that we have to obey God is the fact that he loves us. So we imitate God, and the first way we do that is by walking in love, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we are to walk in love. And, and you know, and I know, if you've studied the Bible or the New Testament in particular, 
that the New Testament is written in Greek, and there's various Greek words that are used for love. In this case, Paul uses the Greek word agape. As John Piper says of agape, he says it's supernatural or divine love characterized by sacrifice in the pursuit of another person's good. This is a God-given love. Lost people cannot have agape love. This is a spirit-born kind of love in your life and in my life. It's the type of love that is highlighted in 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Right, this is not a worldly love that Paul's talking about in, this, in 1 Corinthians 13. It's a God-given supernatural love that Jesus modeled for us. Why should we walk in love? Because Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That is the ultimate example of agape love. Jesus, the sinless one, took the place of sinners. He, he didn't deserve to die on that cross, and yet he went to the cross out of obedience to his Father, and also because he loves you and me. Isn't that good news? So how are we to love? We're to love just like Christ loved us, with agape love, this supernatural divine love. And we are to... Uh, walk in love by loving God and loving others, obeying the great commands that Jesus has given us. And in particular, I would argue that you and I should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should love everyone, but there is a special kind of love that ought to be present in your life and my life for our brothers and sisters in Christ here at Whitefield Baptist Church. Paul, I, I know that John highlights this in 1 John 4. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, and what, what is he talking about with his brother? Brother in Christ, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And I really believe where can you go to experience the greatest love of all? The church. Come to the church to experience this agape love that we are talking about. This is one of the greatest ways that you and I can be strengthened as followers of Jesus Christ. We need not only the agape love of God, which he has definitely demonstrated to us by sending Christ to die in our place, we need the agape love of our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who are going to be there for us at all times. You know, Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Who's going to be there, students, when you walk through your next personal tragedy, when you lose your loved one, you, you lose a grandparent, you lose a parent, uh, when you lose your job, when, when you at school are going through a difficult time, who's going to be there for you through the thick and the thin? Well, if you're part of a biblical church, you can count on your brothers and sisters in Christ to be there for you. Many a trial that I've gone through, and God has used the church to strengthen me. I'm so thankful for the body of Christ that surrounds me with agape love, and it's the same body of Christ, if operating according to God's design, that will surround you with the agape love of God. So we see that God has loved us, and because he has loved us, chiefly through sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, you and I are to walk in love. You and I, the pattern and practice of our life ought to be agape love. And the question is, are you walking in love? Are you willing to make the personal sacrifices that are required to, to live out agape love, where you are making personal sacrifices in the pursuit of the good of others. See, this is countercultural in this selfie world that you and I live in, where we are self-consumed, self-absorbed. Agape love is not consistent with that kind of thinking and that kind of life. You and I are called to so much more. Walk in love. Firstly, love God. Secondly, love others. If you rightly love God, the natural overflow of that is you will love your neighbor and you will especially love your brothers and sisters in Christ 
It's in the church we can experience that kind of love. So that's the first command from Paul. Walk in love. Next, he's going to command the Ephesian believers to walk in light. And we're going to see what he really is talking about when he says light. He's, he's commanding them to walk in holiness. Look at verses 3 through 4. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So we see here in these verses that there is to be absolutely no impurity to be named among God's people. What does it mean for you to walk in light? No impurity is to even be named among you in your behavior, in particular with sexual immorality. He says sexual, sexual immorality and all impurity are not to even be named among you. He uses this word for sexual immorality, porneia. It's where we get our word pornography. It's any sexual behavior outside of God's standard. And then impurity is akatharsia. Man, my Greek's not good this morning. Akatharsia. It refers to immoral thoughts, passions, ideas, fantasies, and every other form of sexual corruption. So, and that's John MacArthur saying that. So Paul is really zooming in here on sexual sin. Evidently, the people in Ephesus struggled with sexual sin. It was a highly sexualized culture, much like the one that we live in, by the way. So this has a lot of application for you and for me today. This porneia, this akatharsia, they are to not even be named among us. And then he even lists covetousness. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines covetousness in this way. It's marked by inordinate desire for wealth or possessions or for another's possessions. So this covetousness, you, you're, you want what somebody else has. You have this crazy desire for the wealth that someone has, their stuff that they have, or maybe even the person they're married to, their boyfriend or girlfriend. You have an inordinate sinful desire for what someone, else's, someone else possesses. So no impurity in our behavior. In particular, we have to walk in sexual purity, but also in our speech. Verse 4, did you notice that? There's to be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, or crude joking. They're out of place. What we've talked about many times before, the greatest revealer of the condition of your heart, the center of who you are. If you want to really know who you are, listen to the words that you speak. And Jesus tells us the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It's out of the overflow of your heart, you speak. Your words reveal your heart. So Paul's listing here, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. This is, once again, talking about speech of a sexual nature. That is sexually immoral. And I have to say, students, I listen to you all. In particular, I want to talk to my guys right now. And I love you. But I hear you say things that break my heart and break the heart of God. When you use crude joking, foolish talk, they are totally out of place, shouldn't even be named among you. And what you need to know when you're using crude joking, foolish talk, talking in a sexually immoral way, it reveals a great deal about your heart. When you talk in a sexually immoral way, it reveals a sexually immoral heart. Guys, when I hear you say things, like I hear some of you say, saying totally inappropriate things, it concerns me for your manner and practice of life. What are you doing in private? What is feeding these words that are coming out of your life? This is serious business. Uh, listen to the seriousness of the sexual immorality in verses 5 and 6. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. For those who are walking in sexual immorality, both in behavior and in your speech, and likely those two things are very much connected, Paul is crystal clear. If the pattern or practice of your life is sexual immorality, know this, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. God will not let sin go unpunished. And sins of a sexual nature reveal a great deal about where you stand with Jesus. Because sexual immorality is not even to be named among us, if your life is consumed with sexual immorality, it likely reveals this. You are not in Christ. Or at least, if you're not burdened about your sexual immorality, it reveals an absence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. I'm praying for great conviction right now. You ought to not be known for your sexual immorality, but at the end of verse 4, you ought to be known for thanksgiving. No fool's talk, crude joking, out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. But so often our lives are filled with sexual immorality. Our lives are filled with grumbling and complaining. The last thing on our minds is thanksgiving, giving thanks to God, giving thanks to our parents for how they provide for us, how they take care of us, giving thanks to our friends. We are not a thankful people because we're so self-consumed and so consumed in our impurity. In this culture that we live in, it's a sexually immoral culture. And statistics tell me, in particular, guys, you're getting eaten alive by our culture, by the world that we live in, and my heart breaks for you. And I hope you see the urgency of this message this morning the sexually immoral have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. This life is so much more than the here and now. We have all of eternity. This life is but a breath. It's a vapor. It's here today, gone tomorrow. You're a breath away from meeting your maker. Are you ready? Lay down your sexual immorality. Lay down your impurity. Be done with it and come to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of the faith, who has his arms wide open and tells you and me this morning, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. As Pastor Mike has said so many times, if you come to Jesus as a sinner, he will never fail you as Savior. Students, I plead with you. Just because everybody else is sexually immoral doesn't make it right for you to be. See the urgency this morning. There's no place for you in the kingdom of God if you're going to walk in sexual immorality. And Paul continues this train of thought in verses 7 through 8. He says, therefore, do not become partners with them, with those walking in spiritual darkness. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And in particular here, he's, he's talking about you were once darkness, you were walk, once walking in spiritual darkness, referring to the life before Jesus Christ, when they were consumed in sexual immorality, and yet it sounds like they're still struggling with sexual immorality. He's saying, don't, don't partner with those walking in spiritual darkness. Walk as children of light. Walk in holiness. And how do you know that you are walking in holiness? What's the fruit that will overflow from your life? Look at verses 9 and 10. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Those in the light are to be known for their fruit which is all that is good, right, true, and pleasing to the Lord. Think about the fruit of the Spirit. You go to Galatians 5 and see what the fruit of the Spirit is and what the, uh, the, the works of the flesh are. 
So much of the works of the flesh are sexual in nature, fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Sometimes mess that up. I hope I got that right. But see the difference. Are you producing the fruit of light? Is there discernment in your life? Verse 10, try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Discerning is being able to tell the difference between what is true and what is false. To tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Or so you able to discern, tell the difference between that which pleases the Lord and that which doesn't. And so many followers of Jesus Christ lack discernment because they lack a healthy diet in the Word of God. How are you supposed to tell the difference between what is true and what is false if you're not going to the truth, the standard of truth, which is the Word of God, on a regular basis? How are you to know what is pleasing to the Lord apart from going to His revealed will in the Scriptures where He has revealed to us what is pleasing to Him? We need time in the Word. What does a lack of regular time spent with God and His Word reveal in your heart? It reveals a lack of the fruit of light. Do you actually have a relationship with Jesus? Do you believe apart from Him you can do nothing? You need His Word. You need His Word. Are you walking in the light? And when you do, the light has an incredible purpose to serve. Verses 11 through 14, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. And uh, Paul's there at the end, quoting uh, Isaiah 60, verse 1. So, so what is the function of the light? What does it mean to walk as children of light? Well, you don't participate in the works of darkness. You don't participate in their, notice, unfruitful works, purposeless works, futile works. A purposeless, purposeless life is a life devoted to darkness because it, it totally misses Eternity. It's focused on the here and now. Focused on self and pleasing self, pleasing your sinful desires. So we, we don't take part in the works of darkness. Instead, we expose them. We expose the darkness. You go into a dark cave, for instance. Can't see anything. But you bring in a flashlight. And what does the light do? It exposes darkness. When you go into a really dark place, man, it just takes a little bit of light to expose the darkness that you are in. So we live in a very dark world. It is a sin-broken world. So how are you and I to expose the works of darkness in the here and now? We do it by sharing the message of the gospel, which is the message of light. This reveals who the light is, and it's Jesus Christ. He is the light of the world. The message contained in this book is able to open the eyes of our heart, the Holy Spirit using the Word of God, so that we can see the light, to see our need for Jesus Christ. We expose the darkness in this world by speaking the truth, by speaking of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. And Paul gives an invitation to those in darkness. We, we see that the light exposes the darkness. The things that are shameful even to speak of. The things that we do in secret. Verse 12. But here's his invitation. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is an invitation for those who are in darkness to come to the light. 
See your need for Jesus Christ, the one who took your place. Be rid of your darkness. Say no more to your old manner of living and say yes to Jesus. Say yes to a life in the pursuit of knowing the light of the world better and better and sharing the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who are consumed in darkness today. This is an invitation to put off the old self and to put on the new self. Today you can be free. You can be free from pornography. You can be free from sexual immorality in that dating relationship. You can be free from it all. Come to Jesus Christ. Come to him. Come to him. You know, we, we're not only called to walk in love, we're called to walk in light. We're called to walk in holiness. This is not optional. Apart from this holiness we're talking about, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. One of my heroes of the faith is Billy Graham. Uh, and one of the reasons why I, I admire and respect and love Billy Graham so much is because for decades, for decades, it's almost like a 70 year ministry that he had. No scandals at all. You know, it's amazing. Never accused of sexual immorality, any kind of impropriety, because he and his closest team members in his ministry at the age of 31, they did this thing called the Modesto Manifesto in a hotel room, I believe where they made a commitment to one another in regards to maintaining purity, not only sexually, but in terms of finances as well. They, they agreed they would never be alone with another woman except their wives. And so Billy Graham took this a step further whenever he would stay in a hotel room. He refused to stay in a hotel room with a TV because he didn't want there to be any kind of accusation towards him. He wanted to be totally above reproach. Walk in light. In the same way you and I are called to walk in life. And the way that God could use someone who's, who's walking in holiness, who's walking in love. Oh my, what amazing things that he can do through a clean and committed vessel. You are to be the light of the world. Are you living out your identity as a follower of Jesus? And here's the critical question. Is your life devoted to concealing darkness or exposing it? Those who walk in life, light expose darkness. Those who walk in darkness conceal it. They have those secret sins that no one else knows about. God does. God does. No reason to conceal it any longer make it no confess it to god trust in christ and be set free so we walk in love we walk in light and finally we walk in wisdom verses 15 through 21 is where we're going to see this what what does it mean for you and i to walk in wisdom let's look at verse 15 look carefully then how you walk not as unwise but as wise Wisdom is defined, as I've heard it defined, skill in the art of godly living. It's rightly living out God's word. It's not just knowing the truth of God's word, but rightly applying it in your life as well. And so Paul tells us here we're to look carefully then how we walk. We're to regularly examine our manner of living to see if we are walking in love, walking in light, and walking in wisdom. Uh, this personal examination is to be a regular spiritual discipline in our lives. Our, <laughs> how are we doing? Are we walking in faithfulness or are we not? So we are to carefully look how we walk, not as unwise, but as wise, rightly living out the truth of God's word. And what are some indicators that we're doing this? Verse 16, we make the best use of the time. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Today, what is our most precious commodity? What is 
or what is more precious than anything else, time. You hear people, they're busier than ever, even during this COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, it forced us to slow down, but I can tell you, I didn't get any less busy, actually. I actually found myself getting busier in a time that we were able to slow down, quote unquote. We're to make the best use of the time because our time is limited and the days are evil. There are billions of people who don't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And are we using our time to make a difference in these people's lives? Are we using our time to advance the kingdom of God by studying the Word of God so we can go out and proclaim the Word of God? According to Common Sense Media teenagers, do you know what the average, how, how much the average American teenager is staring at a screen on a daily basis? This shocked me. Nine hours a day. Nine hours a day. You're supposed to be sleeping eight. You're supposed to be at school eight. So where does that leave time for you to be in God's Word? It doesn't. It doesn't. Are you and I making the best use of the time? There's so much time that you and I waste. Someone who's walking in wisdom prioritizes the time for God and His Word because they prioritize God as most important and see their time with God as absolutely a need. It's essential. So they make the best use of the time and they understand and do God's will. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Sometimes we speak of God's will as a mysterious thing, and I don't think we need to. I think the Lord has made his will abundantly clear. And once again, I point back to the Bible. You want to know what the will of the Lord is? Look here. It's clearly stated in verses like 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. The will of God is your sanctification, and you will not be sanctified apart from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God using the Word of God to transform you and grow you into the image of, your, of His Son, Jesus Christ. And there's other verses that we could list there, but for time's sake, we won't. God's will is made crystal clear in His Word. So we understand and do God's will when we're walking in wisdom. We're filled with the Spirit rather than alcohol. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So I know I'm primarily talking to people who are under the age of 21, so alcohol shouldn't even be a part of your life. The law of the land at age 21, until then you can't drink. So I'm going to assume you don't drink. But Paul is telling us here, don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And when he's talking about being filled with something, he's talking about being under the control of something, surrendering to something. He's saying, hey, be under the control of the Spirit. Be, surrender to the leading of the Spirit. Don't be under control of wine. Uh, don't, don't get drunk on wine. You, uh, the wine impairs you, impairs your judgment. And that's just not alcohol. It's a lot of other substances as well. And I know our teenagers struggle greatly with substance abuse here in the United States. It's been a problem for quite some time. And I would tell you, if you have an issue with this, you need to get help. Because it's not something that likely is going to go away. And you can't do it on your own. You need help. Are, are you walking? By the Spirit? Are you being filled by the Spirit under His control? And then we address one another by speaking and singing truth. This is one of the main ways we're strengthened by the body, body of Christ. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. One of the ways that you and I are strengthened is when our hearts are right and we come to church on Sundays and we sing together. We sing the truth of God's Word. We sing truths about Jesus. We sing truths about God the Father. And it strengthens us. It transforms us. Corporate worship is a beautiful thing, and it's commanded here. You and I are commanded to sing, to sing the truth of God's Word, and to speak the truth of God's Word 
one another. We are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This is the way we are to talk to one another. Because remember, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you have a life filled, a heart filled with the word of God and the spirit of God, what will overflow? The word of God. Things that please God. Encouraging one another. Speaking truth and love to one another. This is how we are strengthened. And this is how we strengthen others in the body of Christ. We'll always give thanks to God, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, we'll submit to one another, one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Man, when we are part of a body of believers that walks in this way, we will be strengthened. When we're around people who are constantly thankful for what God has done in their lives or speaking the truth of God's word to you. When we're, when we're around people who will submit to us, will serve us out of reverence for Christ, you can't help but be encouraged and be strengthened. But when we are not all in with a local church, we rob ourselves of the opportunity to be strengthened by the church. Paul's very clear. What is what does it mean to live out your new identity in Jesus Christ? Well, you will walk in certain ways. The pattern and practice of your life will be identified by love, by light, by holiness, and by wisdom. Are these three identifying characteristics of your life? Students, we, tonight, this morning, we, we talked about some weighty things. We really did. And I would encourage you, in particular, when we were talking about sexual immorality, if you felt conviction about that, you need to speak with someone. We have resources here as a student ministry to help you get out of the hopelessness of sexual sin. It doesn't have to be the end for you. You don't just have to throw up your hands and say, well, everybody's doing it. I can't get away from sexual sin, so I might as well just continue in it. No. God has a better plan for your life, and it's for you to be set free. And you can be set free in Christ this morning, this very moment. Would you surrender to him today? Would you come to him and say, God, I, today I, I see you've revealed something in my heart. You've revealed something in my life. I've been walking in darkness, but the truth of your word has exposed this light in my life, and now I see my sin, and I see my need for you. Come to him and be set free. Come to the church. Be strengthened. Be encouraged. We need the church. We need to be in this kind of community where people walk in this way. Guys, I love you. I'm thankful for you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm praying for you. Bye.